who was born in Maryland, and we're not really sure if she was born in 1820 or 1821. Uh, she was forced to start working when she was five years old. Uh, she suffered a head injury that caused her blackouts for the remainder of her life in, I believe, uh, 42. No, at the age of 13, excuse me. Uh, in 1844, she married uh, Friedman um, John Tubman, who, like I said, was a free black man. Her master dies. She said, tells her husband, hey, I'm going to make a break for it. Come with me. Her husband says, I ain't going. So she says, okay, fine, whatever. And she ran away 90 miles to Pennsylvania. Six months later, she comes back. Uh, knocks on the door and guess who should answer the door? Guess who answers the door of the family home? Huh? What? The husband. Well, the husband's new wife. <coughs> Basically, he had remarried. Uh, she ain't going to let that stop her, so she says, okay. Uh, some other slaves say, hey, take us. We want him. So she starts uh, taking... Uh, slaves out, once again, never following the same path. Uh, during um, the war, oh, at first her tales of escape, and like I said, she helped more than 300 people escape. Her tales got to be so amazing that even guys like Frederick Douglass didn't believe it until he met her. Well, by, by the late 50, she's got a bounty of $40,000 on her head. And she was worth so much to the anti-slavery movement that basically they would not let her go on any more missions. But guys, during the Civil War, she acted as a nurse as well as a spy. Uh, after the war, uh, she started a home um, for um, the indigent, which is kind of like the homeless um, Negroes in upstate New York. And at... In 1913, this woman, who will soon be the first black woman ever to be on currency, died <coughs> totally impoverished. So, I was supposed to play this at some time. Because it's, it's kind of a sad song. I go, mm. Anyway, during this time, you also have temperance reformers. Those are guys that wanted to... Uh, ban or limit alcohol, uh, they start leaving the Whig Party, go to the Know Nothings, and they're actually able to get uh, limitations on the production of alcohol in 13 states. Red. Meanwhile, we have Pierce becoming president. And guys, the divisions are just, they're getting to a stretching point. Uh, we were going to connect the country, east and west, you know, this was going to be a big goal that was going to unite everybody. Well, was it going to go through the north or was it going to go through the south? Well, a lot of people said it's going to go through the south. Why? Because it would be easier to build it through the south. And with the Gadsden Purchase, basically the U.S. had spent like about $10 million buying 30 million square acre, acres of land from Mexico because it would be easy, easier passes in the mountains. So it looked like it was going to go through the south. Well, Senator uh, Stephen Douglas didn't want that to happen. He wanted a northern route with it based in Chicago. Because it seemed to him to already make sense. Because he already had the north-south connected there. May as well have the east-west as well. Well, how is he going to get the east-west? He has to go... Uh, and do some backroom dealings, you know. California was let in as a free state. Uh, we let Utah and New Mexico, through popular sovereignty, they were going to decide if they were slave or free. Tell you what, we're also going to let the Kansas Territory and the Nebraska Territory decide if they want to be slave or free. And for that, a lot of Southern representatives said, okay, we'll vote for a Northern route. His house divided.
Now this backroom deal of the Kansas Nebraska Act totally infuriated opinion in the North. And Northern coalitions to defeat it coalesced into what's known as the Republican Party. And the North really starts to feel like there's this whole slave power conspiracy going on. Why? Because Southerners were sending out filibustering or kind of adventuring parties to go conquer more territory. And like South America and the Caribbean, like William Walker in 1854, he led an expedition to try to take over Baja, California. That's that strip of California that's underneath California, down in Mexico. It failed the very next year in 1855. He goes and he's able to take over Nicaragua. And after he takes over Nicaragua, he goes, hey America, you want to recognize my Nicaragua? And guess what America does? America recognizes it. Now wait a minute guys, wouldn't the North be crazy? Has America, because Ellen, by the way, he made slavery totally legal in Nicaragua. Now, guys, why would the North be so kind of freaked out about us recognizing a country, a foreign country? I mean, and then we annex it? Doesn't that seem kind of silly? Have we ever recognized a foreign country that we own? Oh, Texas. And that had happened only 10 years prior. So guys, it seemed like a very real threat to them. Not only that, but the government passed the Austin Manifesto. What's the Austin Manifesto? That's us just telling the world, oh, hey, world high. By the way, listen, um, we can take Cuba anytime we want to. Just thought we'd let you know. Thanks. Hey. And once again, to the northern mind, the only reason why we do that is because we wanted more slave territory. Are you taking pictures or texting? Or both? Oh, you're crazy. We'll use it only for pictures, though. Or I will ask you like I have asked so many others. Height. You got it? So then we get people going to Kansas. Because now, remember, Kansas is open to it can be either free or slave. And both sides are sending settlers there. Like Eli Thayer, a northern minister, he starts the New England Immigrant Society that raises funds to buy, like, blankets, flour, uh, you know, other goods that the settlers will need on their journey out there. And he makes sure that every family has a Thayer's Bible, which is a rifle. And Southern ministers are doing the exact same thing. So guys, it should come as no surprise that Kansas totally rubs into violence. And in the vote to make Kansas a territory, 60% of the votes cast in that were illegal. And by the way, it made Kansas a slave state. Well, the Free Soilers are, oh, that's not my state. They formed their own state capital of the Free State of Kansas in Lawrence. And how the slavery guys reacted to that was they went out there and they burned it to the ground. And two of the guys that helped destroy Laura's Kansas were Frank and Jesse James. If any of y'all have heard of those cowboys. God. Well, then you have a guy by the name of Joe Brown, who, he had had some businesses, they had all gone bankrupt, he basically felt like God was telling him to go to Kansas, make sure that it was free, he takes his family out there, 
uh, and in response to the destruction of Lawrence, he gets his sons, uh, he didn't do any of the killing, but his sons kill five pro-slavery men near Pottawatomie Creek. Later on, when reporters would ask him, how come you didn't ask him for a duel, you know? Why, why'd you kill him? He said, oh, one duel to a gentleman, one beat dogs. And we're going to hear more about John Brown in just a bit. <laughs> 